Okay, and great. Take for questions later. So okay, should I just start? Good. Yeah, let's do it. All right. I'm John Rosowski. Uh, I'm a, my PhD is in physiology, though I have a lot of experience in engineering. I've been working on uh, the transmission of sound to the cochlea in uh, lots of animal ears for over 40 years, um, most of that time at the Eaton Peabody Laboratory. Uh, while I've worked on uh, gerbils, cats, alligator lizards, uh, chinchillas, uh, what I want to talk today about is the work uh, done by us and others on the transmission of sound of the cochlea in normal and pathological ears. And I'd like to thank the ARO for this opportunity. So I, I picked a few pieces of uh, the work done here and the work of others to give you a flavor of our research philosophy, review some fundamental concepts, and help you catch up on some newer ideas about middle ear function. So in any uh, one Dr. of these- Dr. Rosowski, I'm yes? so sorry. Heidi's back, so we'll just update her that you int introduced yourself and um, you can monitor the chat. Okay, well then I'll continue forward. Okay. So as in any of uh, these talks, the people who have actually done the work are not the people who are talking. Uh, this is um, a group of our laboratory group from the mid 2000s and this is our early uh, 2010s. Uh, some of the significant people are Bill Peak, uh, Sawmill Merchant, Mike Ravitz, Wade Chen, uh, Heidi Nakajima, uh, and over here we've got uh, Jeffrey Tao Chang and Gabrielle Merchant. Uh, some of this work was also done at the Worcester Polytech uh, with our colleagues there in the Center for Holographic Studies and Laser Micromechatronics. Uh, the director there is Cosme Furlong Vasquez, and uh, there's uh, work from uh, at least six or seven of his graduate students uh, is are, I'm going to be talking about and have contributed to our ideas. So I think this is a fairly mixed audience and I feel I need to at least uh, show some pictures of what the middle ear is. So in the red circle, uh, I've circled the middle ear from this schematic uh, from uh, Perea. Uh, the middle ear sits between the pinna and ear canal on one side and the cochlea on the other. The important features of the middle ear are the eardrum or what I'll call the tympanic membrane or TM. Uh, the malleus, the incus, the stapes, the air-filled middle ear cavity is important to it, what lets the, uh, the ossicles and TM move in response to the sound. And the eustachian tube is also important because it maintains the air within the middle ear cavity. There's also two inner ear structures that are important to how this sound uh, uh, is transmitted to, uh, from the middle ear to the inner ear. And those are the two cochlear windows, the oval window in which the stapes and the uh, surrounded by its annular ligament sit and the round window, which is covered by a thin membrane. The experimental philosophy I'm going to be talking about is a mix of uh, model and interaction really of uh, model predictions, clinical outcomes and measurements in live and cadaveric ears uh, where at the forefront of the modeling was uh, Bill Peak, who was an engineer at uh, MIT. And on the clinical side, as well as the experimental side was Sawmill Merchant, uh, an otologist and clinician scientist at the Ionier Infirmary for many years. First thing I wanna talk about is uh, what happens when there is no middle ear. And uh, to uh, introduce this subject and as was introduced to our idea, we started out with looking at audiometry from people with no tympanic membrane or ossicles. Here are some of those audiometric results where I'm plotting on uh, the y-axis the conductive hearing loss and the x-axis is frequency. Uh, in this case, uh, a conductive hearing loss of zero would be normal hearing and an increased hearing loss is plotted down, just like you would plot an audiogram. The two groups uh, uh, plotted here include a group with the tympanic membrane intact, but the incutostapedial joint completely interrupted. So the ossicular chain is interrupted. 
That was gathered by Peek et al. and includes about, it's the mean of about uh, seven cases. And then there's a group uh, gathered by Beccasy with no tympanic membrane malleus and incus, uh, about uh, five cases. And if we look at the hearing in these uh, uh, means of these two populations, we can see that the hearing loss is greater than 40 dB. There's a conductive hearing loss greater than 40 dB and uh, as large as 65, almost 70 dB. But the hearing loss is relatively flat. The way that uh, we approached uh, this was to start out thinking in terms of what the, the, the normal ear does. And in terms of the normal middle ear, it's the inner ear, which is important, which responds to the sound pressure difference between the oval and round window. So this is sound pressure at the oval window minus sound pressure at the round window. And in the normal ear, the sound in the ear canal moves the tympanic membrane, which moves the ossicles, which moves the oval window, which moves the fluid through the cochlea and uh, comes out the round window, if you will. And it's that uh, inward outward motion of the round window which is important uh, to uh, driving the fluid and causing basilar membrane motion. And that motion is dependent upon the difference in sound pressures between those two windows. So in the normal ear, this pressure difference is maximized by coupling the output of the tympanic membrane and ossicles to just one of the windows, leaving the oval window, leaving near zero sound pressure at the round window. When the TM and ossicles are removed, they no longer selectively drive the sound pressure at the oval window. And this pressure difference between the two windows is greatly reduced as the two pressures, the pressure at the oval window and the pressure at the round window are approximately equal to the pressure at the middle ear. And this pressure difference is close to zero. So let's, uh, as a codification of uh, this uh, uh, two routes for coupling ear canal sound to the Cochlea uh, uh, comes from Bill Peak. This is just a schematic showing the normal ossicular route that delivers sound directly to the oval window. And then the acoustic route where sound pressures in the tympanic membrane produce sound pressures in the middle ear airspace, which then uh, are uh, distributed between the oval and the round window. As far as quantifying those two routes, uh, I'm plotting here the magnitude of this pressure difference versus uh, sound pressure at the tympanic membrane uh, as a function of frequency. Uh, in red are the measurements of Kurokawa and Good in 1990, from 1995. Uh, Dick Good uh, was an otologist and clinical science and clinician scientist at Stanford. He was also an amateur magician, as one of the things you get from this picture. As far as the acoustic route goes, the route that uh, produces uh, with, without tympanic membrane and without the ossicles, that was quantified by Susan Voss when she was a graduate student uh, here at uh, the Eye and Ear. Uh, she's presently at Smith College, a professor of engineering. And she used um, microphones placed at the oval and at the round window, as well as uh, inside the ear canal to uh, measure the pressure difference between those windows uh, when there was no tympanic membrane or ossicles. And if we look at the, that acoustic route, now let's go back a little bit. If we look at the acoustic route, we can see that it has uh, magnitudes of somewhere between minus 30 and minus 50 dB uh, in terms of this pressure ratio. Now, if the a secular root is what's driving the normal ear, then the difference between the acicular root and uh, the measurement of the acoustic root would be a prediction of the hearing loss with no tympanic membrane and ossicles. Here is a uh, comparison of that predicted conductive hearing loss in green with the audiometric measurements of Beccasy showing tympanic membrane, no tympanic membrane, malleus and encus. And we can see that the two are fairly similar above a kilohertz, but different at lower frequencies. And one of the differences could be uh, the difficulty in producing the large sound pressures necessary to overcome this conductive hearing loss, uh, where the earphones as they're driven might actually cause some vibration and some bone conduction stimulation. So that might explain what's going on here, but it's clear 
uh, uh, this is only uh, half fulfilled and we might need other ways of uh, testing this hypothesis. And one of the ways of doing that is to surgically enhance the acoustic route by shielding the round window from the ear canal. And this is called the type four tympanoplasty for many years. And what it does is as uh, this stiff shield is placed uh, between the ear canal and the round window where the, this airspace is kept uh, um, connected to the eustachian tube, what happens then is that sound pressure in the ear canal only stimulates the oval window. Uh, and doesn't reach the round window. So that th this uh, increases the uh, acoustic uh, root measurement, though it doesn't uh, make up for the difference in middle ear gain. And what we see in the best type four results, a collection from Wolstein over 20 years of work, he shows that he, can, uh, he was able to reduce the hearing loss from uh, 40 and 70 dB up to about 20 dB on a relatively flat case. And if a collection of, of uh, more standard uh, type four results collected by Sawmill Merchant uh, demonstrated that uh, uh, it was often, uh, there was reduced uh, he hearing return at low frequencies. Where the difference between these two uh, is uh, thought to be the difference in the stiffness of the shield. When the shield is very stiff, then there is no sound pressure at the round window. With less stiff shields, the sound pressure at the round window increases, and this difference then decreases. And that idea uh, was uh, confirmed by measurements in uh, cadaveric um, middle ears done by merchant and rabbits. So with no uh, middle ear, the TM ossicular root dominates normal middle ear function and its loss results in 40 to 70 dB hearing loss. These dB changes are the difference between the TM ossicular gain at the oval window and the acoustic root related window pressure difference. With no TM surgical placement of a stiff shield between the round window and ear canal increases the acoustic root and significantly reduces the hearing loss. So the second topic I want to talk about has to do with the contributions of the tympanic membrane to the middle ear function, right? As we've talked about uh, the, in the normal middle ear, the TM and ossicles deliver that increased sound pressure to the oval window of the cochlea via the oscillating stapes. So how is the TM function uh, related to its structure? So one thing we know uh, about the TM, an important structural feature is its area. So we go there, we, you can go back into textbooks and find a description of the middle ear, uh, the tympanic membrane and ossicles in terms of uh, uh, two lever systems, uh, hydraulic lever, but uh, has to do with the ratio of the area of the tympanic membrane, the area of the foot plate, and a mechanical lever having to do with differences in the lengths of the malleus and the incus compared to their point of rotation. So in that uh, old transformer idea, uh, the ratio of the pressures here is related to the area of the tympanic membrane and the uh, lever arm lengths. In humans, uh, the area of the tympanic membrane, that ratio to AOW is about 20. The lever arm ratio is about 1.4, which would produce a theoretical uh, 28 uh, factor of 28 gain where a factor of 28 is equivalent to 29 dB. We can compare that prediction to actual measurements of the middle ear pressure gain that have been performed at uh, different laboratories over uh, uh, 12 years there. So we're plotting that gain in dB where there's zero dB, 30 dB versus frequency, uh, 1,000 Hertz, 10,000 Hertz. And we can see that the maximum gains in these measurements is somewhere uh, above 20 dB in general, on average, uh, a little bit less than the predicted 29, uh, but that uh, at, that's at 1.5 kilohertz. But as you move the lower frequencies or higher frequencies, this gain falls off. And the difference between uh, the predicted gains and these, particularly these roll-offs have to do with constraints placed on this lever system 
uh, by the stiffness of the tympanic membrane and, and the stiffness of the ossicular ligaments that hold it in place and restrict its motion, as well as uh, uh, the fact that the tympanic membrane isn't a piston. But that's one thing that uh, it, it's pretty clear that the area of the tympanic membrane is an important uh, consideration. So how do we figure out what else is important about the middle ear? And just as we did uh, starting out with the no middle ear results, one of the ways we've looked at this is to look at thresholds after simple tympanic membrane replacement to see how replacing the tympanic membrane in a simple manner uh, affects hearing results. These are endoscopic images demonstrating a preoperative subtotal uh, tympanic membrane perforation and a postoperative repair. So here's the preoperative uh, perforation uh, and repairs on the other side. Uh, in this view, it's kind of difficult to see, but the blue circle or blue uh, oval here is basically close to the area of the tympanic membrane. And the malleus is oriented in this direction where the umbo, the tip of the um, malleus in the center of the tympanic membrane is here. So one of the differences be besides there being a perforation here and a new graft placed here between these two pictures is their color. Uh, in the perioperative view that we see here on the left in A, the ear has been uh, uh, soaked with epinephrine uh, so, and a uh, solution which actually reduces the uh, uh, local blood flow. So that's why it looks so pale. And this is a normal healthy ear uh, three to four weeks after the graft has been placed. And this is the work of Heidi and uh, Nakajima and Aaron Riemann Schneider. Also part of their work was measuring the conductive hearing loss in uh, 11 cases who have had this type of surgery. Uh, where the replacement uh, tympanic membrane material was muscle fascia, which is the uh, soft tissue over bundles of uh, muscle fibers. And in this case, we're looking at the conductive hearing loss uh, versus frequency in 11 ears that have had this surgery. Uh, one of, there's lots of variation with one of the ears actually having a, uh, a super normal uh, hearing response with uh, uh, negative conductive hearing loss, and but on the others have uh, he, he, conductive hearing losses as large as 30 to 40 dB. And on average, uh, actually on median, the median hearing loss is 20 dB or 15 dB in that range at low frequencies with an increase or improvement to 5 dB at uh, 2 kilohertz. Now, interestingly, these uh, same patients were also shown to have, uh, besides their uh, continued uh, hearing loss, that their uh, thresholds are accompanied by decreases in the wideband acoustic absorbent, absorbance, absorbance, there you go, where the absorbance is plotted here on the uh, y-axis varying between one and zero. Frequency is here between 200 and 6,000. The measurements of absorbance in these 11 patients, so we're looking at the uh, median in black, the interquartile range in gray. We can see that the, those measurements at frequencies above 1,000 hertz are significantly uh, different than measurements made in normal ears uh, using the same equipment. So as the gross structure, certainly the area and connection of the malleus of the graft and the real tympanic membrane are similar, the increased thresholds and the low absorb absorbance most likely result from finer differences in the structure of the graft and the TM. So what is the structure of the tympanic membrane? So if we first start looking at it macrostructure, uh, this is a picture of the tympanic membrane from the ear canal that uh, is part of uh, Henson's chapter in 74 showing its near uh, circular shape, the uh, um, embedded malleus uh, in the tympanic membrane with uh, ossicles behind it. This is a view from the ear canal. And the curved lines are there to represent the fact that the tympanic membrane is uh, more tent-shaped with uh, curving into the uh, middle ear airspace. 
On the right is actually a holographically measured shape done by Kligi at uh, the Worcester Polytech in 2015. Uh, you can uh, get an appreciation for the circular shape, but you also get the largest appreciation for the uh, depth of the uh, cone or depth of the tent, if you will, in the uh, tympanic membrane, where this depth is about two millimeters. So what about finer structural differences? So if we take a look again on this side, uh, on the left-hand side at Henson's picture, if we were to take a section through the ear uh, at this level of this picture, we could see something that looks like this, where this is a histologically prepared section of the temporal bone. And here is the ear canal. This is the middle ear airspace, the eustachian tube, the cochlea, the tympanic membrane, and these are the mastoid air cells. If we blow up a bit and look at the isolated tympanic membrane, we can see the uh, malleus uh, attachment to the tympanic membrane here. And we can also get a view uh, of the fact that there's a difference in this variation in the thickness of the membrane where it's thickest near the malleus and near its edges and thinnest in between. And OCT measurements have uh, led to a uh, conclusion that the tympanic membrane varies in thickness between, between 20 and 200 micrometers. Again, being thinner in the centers of these regions. Now, if we take a look at uh, the really microstructure, uh, looking at a cross section from this region, actually, uh, actually this is a schematic view of that. We can see that the tympanic membrane is made up of uh, multiple layers. We're on the external ear side. There is an epidermal epithelium, much like uh, the skin that uh, covers the ear canal wall. On the middle ear side, there's a mucosal endothelium, which is much like the uh, layers of tissue that surround the insides of uh, or, or, or cover uh, any airspace within the body. And in between those, something that's different for the tympanic membrane is, uh, are there are layers of collagen fibers where one of the layers is oriented radially so that these are fibers that uh, move from the rim to close to the center of the tympanic membrane and can attach along the arms of the malleus. There's also circular fibers. And it's these fibers which are pro primarily, we believe are primarily responsible for the mechanical properties of the membrane itself. So, Let's look further into the, how the tympanic membrane contributes to middle ear function. And the, one of the ways of doing that is to look at the measurements of tympanic membrane motion, where it's believed that, and that the sound-induced motion of the TM, or it has to be, is determined by its material properties and shape, as well as its acicular load and bony support. In 1972, uh, Tondorf and Kana, this is a picture of Sham Kana, who was at Columbia University, demonstrated that sound induced motion of the TM can be described by the activation of multiple motion modes, where each mode has a specific 3D shape and the best frequency. And those uh, modal shapes are determined by the material properties as well as the support of the membrane. This is a uh, demonstration of a low order modal motion of a uniform circular plate. Uh, it's an example of the second lowest mode of motion. And in the second lowest mode of motion, half the membrane is moving up and the other half is moving down. And uh, they have peaks of uh, similar magnitude on either side. And that's because of the uniform uniformity of the material. We can also look at the lowest order mode of motion of a circular plate, but this time with a point load at the center. So in this circular plate, all the points on the plate are moving up and down with the sound stimulus in phase, but there are differences in the magnitude, where one of the differences in magnitude in the center here is because there's been a load placed at that, at that place. So that point on the membrane is moving less than most of the surrounding area. 
So let's take a look at a real tympanic membrane. So these are the results of stroboscopic holography measurements of tympanic membrane motions done by Jeffrey Chang and Cosme Furlong at the Worcester, Worcester Polytech. This is a cadaveric uh, tympanic membrane in the middle ear. Uh, you can see here is where the manubrium would be. This would be the umbo in the center of the tympanic membrane. This would be towards its rim. And as we set it into motion, you can see that uh, most of the membrane surface is moving in phase, up and down, all together, and that there are multiple peaks, local peaks on the membrane surface, but there's also a decreased motion where the manubrium is. So these kinds of patterns, this in phase motion uh, with low frequency stents, low frequency stimulation is approximated by, I said, the lowest order modal pattern with a 3D shape of S0, where S0 is dependent upon the material properties of the membrane and how it's supported and how it's constrained by the ossicles. And it also has a modal frequency of omega naught. So for a sinusoidal stimulus of amplitude P and radial frequency omega, the displacement at each location and time is related to the stimulus amplitude, the modal shape and amplitude, which depends upon the material properties and the constraints, the difference between the modal frequency and the drive frequency, and a damping term, where the overall magnitude of this depending on, is going to be frequency dependent, and the largest magnitudes are going to occur when the modal frequency and the drive frequency are equal, this term becomes zero. And that makes this the uh, displacements large, though uh, that it's prevented from blowing up by the presence of the damping term, which limits the largest motions of that, that are produced uh, as we vary frequency. So if we look at a much higher frequency, 10 kilohertz, we're no longer seeing a single mode of motion. Instead, we're seeing a complex uh, combination of multiple modes, where uh, the idea that there are multiple modes could, one idea is that there are these multiple fingers that are moving up and down. The other is you can actually see a traveling wave mode that is moving from the inferior towards the superior here. But on, and on top of all these things, there is a general up and down motion of the entire structure. And that's suggestive of the continued presence of a lower order mode, right? So that the sums of that lower order mode and several higher order modes, including the traveling wave, all go together to describe the motion at each location and each time. So sound-induced TM motions are a sum of different pressure, different modal displacements determined by the membrane's material properties and support constraints where the amplitude of different modal patterns depends in part on the proximity of the modal and driven frequencies. The number of, number of modal patterns contributing to the surface displacements increases with increased frequency, but with continued presence of low order modes that produce in-phase motion of, over much of the surface. So Umbeline de, de La Rochefoucauld and uh, Lisa Olson uh, came to similar conclusions about the motion of the gerbil tympanic membrane. So we saw traveling waves on the tympanic membrane. Do those actually contribute to its function? So this is just a restatement. We see uh, multiple modes and traveling waves. There are several theories that suggest that all tympanic membrane modal motions are initiated by traveling waves that start at the rim and move to the center. We've observed the tympanic membrane's response to impulse-like clicks to readily identify traveling waves and separate out the uh, uh, steady motions from the traveling motions. And this is the work of Ivo Dobrev and Payam Razavi at uh, also at the Worcester Polytech. So this is a complicated slide, but I think it's uh, sh should be uh, it's it's important and could be of interest. Uh, this is a in the center here we see the green surface is a. 2D representation of the 3D shape of a tympanic membrane. This was um, measured 
uh, using uh, holographic techniques by uh, Payam Razavi. Uh, what we're going to uh, plot on top or use, uh, uh, we're going to use colors, uh, this color map here to describe the motion at different points on the membrane surface, where large outward motions will be uh, uh, colored red and large inward motions will be colored blue. Also on this surface, we see two contour lines. The red line, uh, whose uh, uh, 2D shape is plotted here, and we'll also plot the motions on top of it. Uh, the blue line is plotted here, and we'll again also plot the motions on top of it. But it'll you'll be hard to see, and it will be easy if we look at the tympanic membrane for those motions. And it, Second important part besides the tympanic membrane surface is this plot, which is a plot of the displacement of the umbo, which is where these two curves intersect as a function of time. And that will be, we'll be looking at that for three milliseconds, where at time zero, at zero milliseconds, we're gonna send a pulse to a speaker to create a click. And it's going to take a little time for that click to propagate to the membrane, but then it'll set it into motion. And it'll be easiest if I control the time here. So I'm going to move slowly. We can see the umbo motion in that uh, center plot of the low line continue on at zero as the click has yet to arrive at the membrane surface. And right there, I'm going back and forth. You can see the umbo start to move. If we look at the same, at the as I play around at that time period again with what's going on in the membrane surface, we can see that just before we register motion of the uh, uh, umbo, there's slight changes in color of the tympanic membrane surface, but it's and it's the entire surface. So within a frame uh, of this movie, which is equal to 25 microseconds. Uh, the entire membrane is set into motion, and the umbo seems to lag that by uh, just another frame or so. So if we let this continue, we can see as we uh, move forward in time, the umbo continues to move in, and we start to see large displacements, large inward displacements on the surface of the membrane. But here, which is about where the umbo is reaching its um, most inward motion, we also start to see some yellow on the tympanic membrane surface. So it, where parts of the membrane are already starting to move outward. And as the umbo moves outward, reaching its mar largest maximum out outward motion, you can see that most of the membrane is also moving outward, though some of it continues to move outward as the umbo starts to return. I'm now gonna let this run and the umbo motion will dampen out it might be uh, stimulated by some low order reverberation. But if we look at the surface of the membrane, we can see that there are now waves that are traveling all over the surface, generally from in to out, but sometimes circularly. And I will let this run by itself once, just one by your, so you can uh, maybe appreciate those later mo motions. So while these waves are traveling, the umbo is, uh, motions are very small. So let's take a look at the motions of particular points on the membrane surface. This is the work of Jaime Tang and Jeffrey Chang. Uh, here we have a, a 2D representation of a different tympanic membrane surface where we've uh, isolated five points, one in the center of the umbo, P1, and uh, four other points. Uh, and we're going to take a look at the motion of those that is produced by an impulsive sound stimulus. So up top here on the right is the sound pressure plotted versus time. So this uh, click that we produced has a uh, positive pressure and a negative pressure associated with it of about 10 pascals. So it's got an equivalent sound pressure level of about 110 dB SPL. And that click is introduced and then it rings a bit before going to zero. 
If we look at the displacement functions at these five points, uh, we can see that uh, the points that are not the umbo, where the umbo is in the cyan or blue, points that are not the umbo, uh, start moving a little bit after the pressure pulse, but they're all moving in phase, all, all moving simultaneously together. The umbo starts to move a little bit later. It also seems to reach its peak, both its uh, negative peak and its positive peak, uh, a little bit later. And we can see that the motion of the umbo is smaller than the motions of the other locations. It also has somewhat different timing. Actually, all the different locations, uh, the timing of the displacements could, are, are uh, vary between the four locations. One thing we could do from these plots is look at the magnitude of motion by uh, taking the RMS average of the motion at each location. And that's what's actually plotted in this surface in color, where small motions such as what's going on at the umbo are in this uh, uh, dark to medium blue, and the larger motions move towards yellow and green, green and yellow. Now, what we're seeing here in terms of the displacement plots, right, this temporal variation of the, of the displacement is actually uh, a combination of the response of the membrane and the temporal variations due to the pressure waveform, right? And we can remove the uh, temporal variations of the pressure from these responses by computing something called the impulse response. And this is a picture of the computed impulse responses for those same five points on the membrane surface of this membrane. And uh, what we can see is that uh, as far as the, the timing of the curves and uh, the magnitudes of the peaks, and, and there are still variation uh, with, between the five points. But what we can do with pictures like this or from uh, data like this, since we have this impulse response for each and every point on the tympanic membrane surface, we can pick out uh, response features which can be related to different uh, mechanical features of the membrane. One of those is the peak. We can, where this is showing uh, the marked peak of the uh, first wave uh, at each point, and we can see that those uh, peak values vary between, uh, peak times vary somewhere between 0.1 and 0.2 over the membrane surface. We can also look at the dominant frequency by doing a uh, FFT of this, uh, of the computed impulse response, and we can see that the dominant frequency of the different points on the membrane uh, also vary and will vary uh, between uh, something like uh, two kilohertz to uh, 500 hertz. And we can also look at the decay time, the time it takes for the uh, amplitude of the impulse response to decay to 30% of its peak value. And where that decay time is uh, one of the places it's uh, lowest is at the uh, umbo, and it's largest at, uh, say, P5. And that varies between something like 0 0.5 to 1.5 milliseconds. And you, you can get an appreciation for the umbo uh, decaying faster than the others. So those last two uh, features of the impulse response that we measure from the impulse response are important in that they allow us to estimate something called the damping ratio, uh, where the damping ratio is equal to the decay rate over the dominant frequency. And the damping ratio is an important uh, descriptor of the mechanics of uh, systems. Uh, and if we look at this damping ratio, uh, summarized over eight temporal bones, over the surface of eight temporal bones. We can plot this ratio versus the local dominant frequency. Uh, we can see that that ratio is highest at low frequencies and decreases as frequency increases. This, by the way, is the work of Dima Maftoun, who was a postdoc with us and now is at University of Waterloo. So this frequency dependence of the uh, 
damping ratio or is consistent with some uh, uh, published views of the damping within the tympanic membrane, but uh, contrary to other views. So it helps us uh, uh, decide which models of the tympanic membrane are appropriate and actually allows us to put values uh, on some of the mechanical properties of the membrane. So if we look at our click displacement summary, uh, click stimuli set the entire free surface of the TM into motion within 25 microseconds, within one frame of our uh, high-speed camera, with motion of the malleus falling certainly within uh, 50 microseconds, if not uh, uh, 25 microseconds. The traveling waves are secondary phenomena that play little role in the middle ear's response to clicks. Yes, we see them, but they don't seem to be related to the motion of the umbo. And the impulse response is related to the material properties of the TM and its support and its load. And so those things are important because there are uh, different groups around uh, the world, including a group at the eye and ear infirmary, who are trying to produce uh, tympanic membrane graphs uh, where that are more realistic and they're using measurements and uh, to guide the development of those new replacement materials, as well as predictions of the materials from things like our impulse responses. So that group was uh, led by Nicole Black, who uh, was a doctoral student at Harvard, and uh, her supervisors were Aaron Riemenschneider, Elliot Cozen, and Jeffrey Chang. And Nicole used uh, 3D biological printing to produce uh, tympanic membrane-like uh, grafts where these included uh, radial and circular fibers. She was also e able to impart uh, depth to the cones so that uh, the membranes varied in shape, in 3D shape from flat to a three millimeter uh, cone. And she used uh, techniques used to measure tympanic membrane motion to uh, test the uh, lifelikeness of these graft materials, where uh, this is a plot of the center velocity measured with a laser Doppler vibrometer when, when the uh, graft is stimulated by sound as a function of frequency. And this, uh, for this particular material shows that uh, there's a big difference in the peak depending upon whether the membrane is flat or whether its uh, uh, cone is one, two, or three millimeters. And it also where the measurement at two millimeters uh, uh, with a two millimeter cone is probably most like the measurements made in a real tympanic membrane. She also used uh, holography to uh, estimate the uh, modal motion patterns as well as the modal frequencies of the uh, different depths and different materials. So that's all I'm gonna say about the tympanic membrane. Uh, I do wanna now move on and talk a little bit about the how ossicular joints affect hearing function because this is something that is uh, certainly has come out within the last 20 years. And in, if we go back to our uh, interaction of outcomes, we're gonna take a look at measurements of ossicular motion and use those to uh, change our views of uh, or at least test our views of model predictions and clinical outcomes. The data I wish to start out with is actually laser Doppler vibrometry measurements of sound-induced ossicular displacement that were made by Ron Gann at the University of Oklahoma, where she used multiple lasers to measure the sound-induced motion of the middle ear, where she measured the motion of the umbo, she measured the motion of the incus opposite the stapes, and she also measured the uh, motion of the stapes all to sound. The magnitudes of those motions are plotted here in dB. Uh, the phase relative to the sound pressure stimulus is plotted here, as a, and both are as a function of frequency. The umbo is in cyan, the incus is in green, and the stapes is in magenta. So one of the things you can see here is that there are clear differences between the three ossicles. We can better see those differences if we take a look at the ratios of the ossicular motion measurements, where 
Green is now Incus to Umbo and magenta is Stapes to Umbo. So this is uh, demonstrating that in that measurement set, uh, the Incus is moving 10 dB smaller than the Umbo at low frequencies uh, and getting closer to the motion of the Umbo at high frequencies. Whereas the Stapes is, has a similar low frequency uh, decrease from the Umbo and decreases further. There's also a phase delay, which is uh, associated, interposed somewhere between the umbo and the motion of the incus and the motion of the stapes. So we can compare these measurements to that simple view of ossicular motion that I described when I talked about the ear transformer, where what's important here is the uh, ossicular lever as they rotate around here, this simple ossicular lever uh, mechanism would suggest that the motions at the uh, incus and stapes and the motion at the umbo should be related by this difference in length, or which is in this, uh, the way these things are uh, arranged is at 0 0.7 or minus three dB. So that the incus should be moving three dB less than the umbo. And that's not what we see, right? So this is the, in red is the rotation prediction. And we see that uh, it's, uh, it cannot explain the 10 dB differences uh, that were observed experimentally, nor can it explain the phase differences between the different uh, ossicles. So Willie and I'm sorry, Billy and Uber used laser measurements of the motion of many points on the ossicle to demonstrate differences between the sound-induced motion of the malleus and the incus. So here is uh, a view that uh, Billy uh, and Huber, who was a clinician scientist at the University of Zurich, actually is a clinician scientist at the University of Zurich. This is a view of the malleus and incus that they prepared in the temporal bone uh, specimen. Uh, you can see here it's labeled and outlined. The incus shape you should recognize. This is the head of the malleus and the long arm of the malleus. They were able, uh, this would also here in the arrow is what you uh, is anatomically defined as the axis of rotation of these structures. They were able to use a scanning laser Doppler vibrometer to measure the motion of multiple points on these structures uh, as uh, using tonal stimuli. And from those measurements and assuming a, a rotation of the malleus and incus around that ossicular axis, they were able to quantify uh, the rotation of the malleus and the rotation of the incus in terms of a uh, 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 radial displacement. A ratio of those, of that incus rotation and malleus rotation is shown here, where at low frequencies, this is for 10 specimens, the, uh, the, the, that ratio varies between minus three and minus eight dB with larger variations at higher frequencies, where the median uh, difference is minus five dB at low frequencies and minus 12 dB at higher frequencies. So in this uh, rotation of the ossicles, there are some losses that are being introduced. And Billy and Uber's uh, idea is that it, the losses are being introduced by the joint that separates the um, malleus and incus. So about that same time, Kana and de Kramer were using similar techniques, though um, more involved, along with micro CT scans of the ossicular structure. And they were coming to also conclusion, similar conclusions about there being a difference in the motion and the, of the malleus and incus that was not explained by simple rotation. So here is their results of their micro CT scan, the malleus in red, the incus in green, the stapes in blue. These uh, are as if we're arranged, as if we're looking up from the bottom of the middle ear. And let's see what happens when we set this into motion. As we set this into motion, this is with a response to 293 Hertz tone. We can see that the umbo here is moving uh, in and out with a magnitude, which is about twice 
of the in and out motion of the incus and the stapes. We can also see that the malleus and the incus, though they are somewhat restricted by their uh, the ligamentous attachments, which are where the green arrows are, or where the black arrows are, we can see that uh, that axis of rotation uh, is uh, wobbling, that uh, the, the ossicles themselves uh, aren't simply rotating. There's some additional motion. And where that additional motion comes from is apparent uh, when we look at the connection between the malleus in red and the incus in green. We can see the, uh, that there is a opening and closing of the separation between those two, which uh, it must be due to uh, an, an, a stretching and a compression of the ligament that connects these two. Right, so the structures are defined by micro CTs and the ligaments are invisible. We can also see that there's uh, some stretching, if you will, and compression of the incutostapedial joint because at, uh, as the incus moves out, the separation between the incus and the stapes increases, and as it moves inward, it compresses. The other thing, I don't know whether we've mentioned it, but the motion of the incus here is about half the motion of the umbo. So that's consistent with Vili and Uber's uh, idea of there's about a 6 dB difference in the motion of the uh, malleus and incus due to ossicular rotation. And I think I'm going to uh, close out here. I think I'm running out of time, though I uh, let me at least mention uh, this last experiment, since I think it's of uh, some clinical utility. So Heidi uh, Nakajima uh, also probed the flexibility of the joints using LDV measurements before and after ossicular fixations, where in her preparation, she measured the sound-induced motion of the umbo and the sound-induced motion of the stapes, while she either uh, uh, fixed the head of the stapes before and after she fixed the head of the stapes with glues or fixed the stapes foot plate so it couldn't move. If we look at the malleus head fixation measurements. Uh, here are on, on the right, uh, on the left of this panel is umbo velocity and on the right of this panel is stapes velocity. What's plotted is the change in the magnitude of motion produced by the fixation as a function of frequency. And we can see that when she put a, a soft uh, fixation on the malleus head, that it, she was able to reduce the motion of the umbo by about a factor of four dB and that the stapes motion was reduced by similar amounts. When she made a more rigid uh, uh, fixation of the malleus head, uh, she was able to produce a fixation of about minus 17 dB with very similar, uh, similar reduction in the stapes velocity. So when malleus head fixation reduces both stapes and velocity and umbo velocity nearly equally. But stapes fixation has a much smaller effect on the umbo velocity. Right, so when she fixed the stapes extensively, she was able to produce a reduction in its motion of between 30 and 40 dB, but the umbo velocity uh, only changed by on the order of six to eight dB at most. So this is a confirmation of loose ossicular joints uh, because if this, the only way that the uh, umbo could move if the stapes is fixed is if there was some give in the joints that connected them. And this is a, a result which has been used in the clinic to differentiate different types of ossicular fixations. And maybe Gabby Merchant will talk a little bit about that in her talk. All right, I'm gonna move on here and come to some summaries where the ossicular motions in response to low frequency sounds are not explained by simple rigid body rotation. The ossicular joints introduce phase delays and losses in motion magnitude. And the loss of motion across the ossicular joints is used in the clinic to differentiate ossicular pathologies as stapes fixation has little effect on umbo and TM motion. And we didn't talk about that. All right, so what about some future work? What's still to do? Uh, so I think it's pretty clear that modern uh, tympanic membrane reconstructions and ossicular reconstructions 
do not result in normal hearing. And this is especially true at high and extended frequencies. So improvements need to be made in tympanoplasty to better understand the influence of different TM structural features and developing more tympanic membrane-like replacement graphs. Also need to improve ossicular reconstructions through a better understanding of ossicular and joint form and function. Alternatively, uh, would be the continued development of effective active middle ear implantable devices that mimic, mimic ossicular function over a broad frequency range. Another uh, piece for work is ongoing investigations of conductive presbycusis. There is growing evidence that the ossicular joints age and introduce high frequency conductive losses that can be treated by surgery. Research groups at several institutions, including the eye and ear, are investigating improvements in bone conduction hearing tests to better define conductive hearing loss at frequencies of 4 to 16 kilohertz, and which would help identify high-frequency conductive hearing, hearing loss and determine its prevalence. And lastly, uh, we need enhanced descriptions of the middle ear's response to high-intensity sounds. As in, in this present world, uh, more and more uh, people are being exposed to them. So we know that the middle ear acts non-linearly non -linearly with sound stimuli above 125 dB. Where do these non-linear comes from and how do they affect the middle ear sound transfer? Those are questions that are being investigated these days. Also, impulsive sounds of 160 dB SPL or more can cause catastrophic damage to the middle ear, perforations or uh, ossicular breaks. What are the stresses and strains of the TM and ossicles? Are there weak spots proposed to uh, predispose to TM perforations and ossicular damage? And can damage be prevented by pretreatment? Thank you, I'm a little bit over. Just wanna end by uh, noting that this work uh, both at the eye and ear and WPI was supported by multiple grants from the NIDCD and from MEE and WPI development funds. Questions? Thank you, John. I'm sorry that I had trouble technical. That's okay. I'm glad you're back. Uh, any questions from anybody? I have one. Um, I'm wondering, are there any research topics that you've worked on um, that is still a mystery to you? Uh, actually, I, I, I talked about some of them in the future work there. Right? So we have been, uh, uh, Dr. Chang in particular has been looking at the middle ear nonlinearity. And it's, I think from his measurements, there's a suggestion that there are multiple sources uh, and whether those sources are in the uh, ligaments or whether they're in the shape of the tympanic membrane uh, isn't particularly clear. But I, I, I think if there's, there, there should be some influence of the shape uh, on the way the nonlinearity non acts. I also think uh, that in terms of tympanic membrane reconstructions and the, the graphs that the shape is going to be an important feature to that, but I think that is still not completely resolved. Yeah, we're very lucky at Mass Near because um, John is still working with uh, Tao Chen and um, Aaron Remenschneider with those future works that he had um, specified. And personally, I owe John much of what I've learned about the middle ear. And um, really thoroughly enjoy discussing science with John um, because he often is able to add a new perspective to any idea. Um, there's a question here. Um, the new TM replacement material shown on slide 41 had radial and circumferential fibers that are much thicker and sparsely spaced compared to the native TM. Can you speculate if these differences in the fibers affect TM function? Yes, I think is the answer. I, I, that, that would be my speculation. So the versions uh, of the graphs that I sh showed in that slide 
were early versions of the uh, graft, repla graft repl replacements done with a uh, earlier model of the 3D printer. Uh, I believe uh, Dr. Black and her co-workers have been refining uh, uh, certainly the, the size of the fibers. As far as the numbers, uh, I think you know, one, one thing that is uh, unclear or uh, I think which is also important is not only the fibers, but what's the ground stuff, substance, what fills in there. And it's possible that there could be some interaction uh, with the ground substance so that a fewer number of fibers might work. But uh, those are still things that need to be determined. Thank you, Laddick. This is from Richard Schmidt. Um, some years ago, Mario Ruggiero suggested that the middle ear does not serve as an impedance transformer. Do you agree with that? How you doing, Rick? Uh, I think the impedance transformer model has some usefulness to it, but uh, it is certainly limited, right? So uh, some of the limitations you could see in the comparison of that uh, transformer uh, model, let me, and the um, um, data that I showed from uh, of the of the transformation. Uh, yes, so the, the the transformer has you can use it to make predictions, but the predictions it gives you are going to be uh, only ballpark, and you need to take into account uh, other features within the middle ear uh, to uh, actually understand what it's going on. I, I hope that's enough of an answer. Well. Thank you. Um, I think we've run over and please feel free to uh, submit more questions and um, John will answer them via email, I believe. Right, John? I'll try. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. That was very um, nice talk, giving us the big picture. Appreciate it. Thank you, Cosby. Oh, there's there's actually one question that just came up um, from um, Sridhar Kaluri. Yes. You had said there are- How are you doing, Sridhar? I can see it. You said that there are traveling waves evident in the measurements of tympanic membrane motion. Are these easily distinguished from the pre presence of higher order vibrational modes of the membrane? Srila, I, I think that uh, there that that is a good question, uh, which is something I actually don't like to say, but I think it is a good question. So, that, that whether things were traveling or whether things were stationary was one of the reasons that we moved to the click preparation, uh, and uh, I think with the clicks where the stimulus is there and over it's pretty clear that there are traveling waves that are evoked on the membrane uh, having to do with the membrane's response to the uh, uh, click, which is already finished, right? That, so there, there was continued motions and uh, the, the peaks are traveling either towards the edge or they're traveling around in circle, circular motions. So I think, uh, yes, there are traveling waves. Whether they're important to its function is, uh, Certainly in the impulse, it doesn't look that way. Uh, so, but the, the, it's also true that the traveling waves we see with the uh, holography uh, could uh, be the result of uh, the combinations of the different modes. I hope that answers your question. And Thank you. Say, say hi to everybody out there. Will do. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, it's great to see such a great crowd of people we all know. Um, thanks, John, for the wonderful talk about the outer middle ear. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. We can... Uh... Yep.
<laughs> Take care.